Hello, I'm Ian Dale from LBC, and I'm here to tell you about this fantastic book, Eyes and Ears by Sir David Amos. It's the book that everyone is talking about in the Houses of Parliament, and if they're not, they should be. It's not David's autobiography, but there's lots of autobiographical stuff in it, lots of anecdotes about the way that Parliament works or doesn't work. And anybody that gets to the opportunity to hear David talk about the book is in for an absolute treat. I spent an hour talking to him on my Ian Dale All Talk podcast, so do download that. But if you have the chance to see him live, being interviewed about it, do take the opportunity. It really is a great read and he is a great listener. I've known him since 1983 when he was first elected, which ages me and him. We're both West Ham fans. And um, he's just been a brilliant MP. He, he champions his constituency like no other MP does. He stands up for people. And I think he's been the exemplification of what a good MP is. So do read the book, Eyes and Ears by Sir David Amos. Next month, a book which I have written called Eyes and Ears, A Survivor's Guide to Westminster, will be published part of which covers Brexit. And yes, by inference, everyone will be in the book. Would my right honourable friend agree with me that the last general election was not fought on how political parties might handle the coronavirus pandemic, but was categorically about ensuring that the result of the 2016 referendum was implemented in full? Will my right honourable friend confirmed that that is what he intends to see happen. Prime Minister. I, I can indeed, my, Mr Speaker, and I congratulate my uh, right honourable friend on uh, his, uh, his new book. And if you were to read his excellent book, Madam Deputy Speaker, yeah. Eyes and Ears, probably available in all good bookshops, you would be aware that he is the proud patron of the Conservative Animal Wel Welfare Foundation and has devoted much of his life to campaigning on behalf of our furry friends. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to my virtual book tour event. If you would like to ask me any questions during this premiere, please use the live chat box on the screen and I will do my best to answer your question. If you would like to purchase my book, and support one of the three charities I'm raising money for with the sales, there are links in the description to Ian Dale's Politicos or Amazon. You can also get the book directly from the publishers, Luath Press, or through your own Member of Parliament, who I'm sure will be more than happy to collect a copy from my office at the House of Commons. I hope you enjoy the evening. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of my virtual tour. I don't know if you realise, but yeah, I've written a book, and this is genuinely all my own words. Eyes and Ears, A Survivor's Guide to Westminster. Now, it's not really what I would call, ladies and gentlemen, an autobiography, because you usually do that when you've left Parliament and your career has finished. I'm only halfway through my career. <laughs> and uh, when, when I do produce the final book, then I'm really gonna tell it like it is. But at the moment, there's just a little section on types of MPs without me actually identifying them. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we are in for a real treat. Copeland meets the Cotswolds. Now, first of all, we have Trudy Harrison representing the uh, wonderful constituency of Copeland. Now, Trudy, will you tell our audience all about your good self, please? Oh, very quickly. I am Copeland born and raised, but um, perhaps more uh, like Geoffrey, we're known for our national park, which is, of course, the English Lake District. Um, approximately two thirds of my constituency is within that gorgeous Lake District boundary. And I'm proud to have within Copeland, the highest mountain, the deepest lake, the steepest pass, the smallest church, the best liar, 
and various other <laughs> claims to fame in Copeland. But um, I never set out to work in politics. I wanted to be a nanny, actually. And it's been a real career journey. But one of the things that I was utterly surprised about when I arrived in Parliament is how friendly all MPs were towards me cross party. And the best place to learn is the parliamentary tea room, which I think was where I first met you, David. And um, what we don't know about why Southend should become a city isn't worth knowing. And I did wonder. Thank you for that, Trudy. <laughs> eyes and ears, why not? Something <laughs> along the lines of Southend should be a city because that is a, a very repetitive mantra that we hear from you, David. Well, it may be next year's entry into the Eurovision Song Contest. And, and, and Trudy, um, you, you've got four daughters, is that correct? It is. They are above me there. I don't know whether you can see, but yeah, name's in order. Fabulous. Gabrielle's 23. Uh, now, hang Sarah. on, you do not look old enough. You've got a 23-year-old. No I way. I was a lean, mean breeding machine, David. Gabrielle <laughs> is 23, Savannah is 21, Francesca is 19, and Rosemary is just 18. Fabulous girls, highly recommend them. And um, we live very happily with my rather dominated husband, Pua Keith, who's a welder at Sellafield. I'll have to have a get together with your hubby then and share what it's like to be in a mainly all-female house because I have one son and four daughters, all older than yours, of course. Uh, and I've got one getting married on the 23rd of August, fingers crossed, and another one getting married uh, the week before Christmas Day at, dare I say, the Palace of Westminster. Oh, Christmas Eve. Yep. That's yep. our wedding anniversary. My husband... Um was never really that keen on um, a big wedding. So when he agreed to marry me on something like the 10th of December, I quickly whipped him up to Gretna Green and we were married on Christmas Eve. That was some 20, 24 years ago or something and uh, we've stood the test of time. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are learning a great deal about the Honourable Member for Copeland. And if my mother was alive today, she would say with that peaches and cream complexion, it must just be soap and water. Now, we're going from Copeland to very, very posh, because I have been there, haven't I, Geoffrey? The you have. You have. Now, Geoffrey, would you tell the audience how you can compete with Trudy's wonderful constituency. Well, there is nowhere like the Cotswold, which I rep have represented for the last 30 years. Unique landscape, unique buildings, absolutely wonderful, and one of the best constituencies in the country to re represent. But I'm delighted to be joining you, David, uh, with Trudy, and I'm delighted to support your campaign for Southend to become a city. I am sure with your enthusiasm and drive, it will happen <laughs> one day. But I am delighted to be with you both. Um, I, I, for, for, you, you've asked about our families. So I've got two families, two children, both married, both with children. So I've got three grandchildren. But I can beat Trudy because I got remarried last Christmas day. Uh, so I've been married for under a year. And uh, um, we, we, we kept bringing it forward to try and beat the COVID regulations to have at least a few people at our wedding. We weren't allowed many, but we had a few. So we've been um, happily engaged during the lockdown and happily married ever since last Christmas. And, uh, but I've been back in Parliament like you. I've been voting uh, physically, one of the very few 40 people to do so. And I'm looking forward to the time when the country and Parliament can get back to normal as quickly as possible. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I've just learned something about my colleague. Geoffrey, you got married last Christmas. I did, on Christmas Day. The vicar was incredibly kind. God, well, many, many congratulations. I wish you every happiness. And Geoffrey, what, what's that picture behind you? Oh, it's one of our, our dogs. We used to have golden retrievers, uh, really before I became a member of parliament. Um, but it, it's, it, it, ever since I separated from my first wife who looked after them, really being a politician, having a big dog like that, 
isn't doesn't really work. So I'm afraid I don't have any golden retrievers now. But that one we actually bred. He's a he was a great big dog. He was a fantastic dog. Beautiful animal. Well, there we are, ladies and gentlemen, two very different people. Uh, Trudy is relatively new to Parliament and Geoffrey is an old hand, which is why I've asked them to interview me because they'll have a different perspective. Now, who would like to go first? Ladies first, if that's Ladies okay. first, definitely. As you will probably remember, I joined um, the, the rest of parliamentarians following a by-election in Copeland. And I remember, David, when the previous MP resigned and this opportunity became available, trying to find out what life would be like as a member of parliament. Have you written a book with that kind of pipeline in mind? So you would hope, you know, prospective parliamentarians or maybe people thrown in at the deep end, finding themselves on the candidate list ahead of a by-election, might use as a kind of guide too. Um, or what, what was the motivation really to commit such a lot of time and effort and your own personal commitment um, to do this? Well, Trudy, look, um, I've never met a Wilton Barlett who's a member of parliament. We were all quite big people, aren't we? And sort of think that our story is unique. Um, so I've lost count of the number of colleagues who've written a book. But if I say to you, Geoffrey, and you, Trudy, I always think it's rather sad. They tend to do it when they've left Parliament. And there's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty brutal when you're no longer an MP. Bang, it's never, it's as if you never existed. Now, I owe everything to Margaret Thatcher. But even I find some of our younger colleagues, you know, they don't know anything about Margaret Thatcher, really. So I, I wanted to do this book, but I didn't want to be unpleasant about people yet uh, while I was still an MP, because I thought there would be a useful glossary in sharing with people parliamentary terms, for instance, and explaining to them the way we, we, we used to do things and hopefully would do things in the future. And Trudy, I started the book in 1983 because when I was elected first, I didn't think I would be re-elected and re-elected and re-elected for Basildon. So my then secretary uh, sat at a golf ball typewriter doing this book. We've had so many changes and it's been redone over and over again. And I said to my brilliant team, look, we're going to do this book now. Brexit is unique. The coronavirus pandemic has altered all our lives, which is why I quickly put on those two bits at the end of it. And what I'm hoping, Trudy, is that it will be useful. Look, the book isn't for everyone, but certainly for schools, for older children, they'll be interested in some of the things and some of the characters and some of our practices. And I also feel, Trudy, and I know Jeffrey's sort of on the same page as me, that uh, if you love history as I do and love tradition as I do, if, if things are good, then, then, then why change it and why dumb it all down? And I think the fewer of us who remain in Parliament, Jeffrey, who have any experience of these things, uh, our voice is going to be completely lo lost. So I wanted it to be written about and hopefully it will be useful to colleagues. But I have to say, uh, Trudy, look, you're, you're well established now. For goodness sake, you're, you're at the top of your uh, range. You're sitting around the cabinet table as, as one of the prime minister's parliamentary private secretaries. And by the way, Trudy, I'm not going to compare other parliamentary private secretaries. But in my time, the late Ian Gower was absolutely incredible. He was there for Margaret during the good times and the bad times. And um, he, his seat after he died was won by the Liberals. Thank goodness we've got it back now. But if you heard um, Ian Gower speak, he was absolutely wonderful. And of course, there was that 
I, I was dead against it. You, you can see how I'm wandering off the subject completely now, ladies and gentlemen. But um, I was dead against the televising of Parliament, truly, for all sorts of reasons. And Ian Gow was. And uh, we're, we're, when the decision was made to televise Parliament, we were all offered the opportunity to make ourselves beautiful and have makeovers. And he stood up and made one of the funniest speeches ever. And one of the things he concentrated on was his hair. He didn't have one follicle on his head. And we were all roaring with laughter at, at the end of it all. So I think in, in conclusion about the book, um, I, I wanted to do it when I haven't left, lost my marbles completely. And uh, I, I hope that it would be of interest to the wider general public, but particularly to our colleagues. But there may true to be some of our colleagues who think, oh, Amos, he's a has-been. I know it all but it's up to people to make their choice. What, what, what do you think, Geoffrey? Well, I think that uh, what Parliament... I, I was coming on to ask my question, and in a sense, my question encompasses this, because I think what we need in Parliament is a complete representative of the people. And that it means, of course, that we want uh, more women in Parliament, but it means we want some youngsters, and it also means we want some... Older people. Now, people like you and me have seen an awful lot in our parliamentary careers. Mind you, I'm not quite as old as you. I haven't been there quite as long. If, you, <laughs> if you're halfway through your career, I'm only a third of the way through my <laughs> career. So I like that. Um, but no, I think we need a complete representative in Parliament. And so what I was going to ask you, really, you, 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 you described in your interview with Andrew Pearce, and you showed, indeed, the photograph of the very little... East End Terrace, where you were brought up by your parents. And now from those humble beginnings and the local school, you've successfully become a member of parliament. You've successfully become a private secretary like Trudy. You've successfully got on one of the most important panels in parliament, the chairman's panel. Do you think it was more difficult for you then than it would be for a youngster now in a similar situation to get into parliament? Yes. Does that sound bad? No, but, I expected you to say that. Why, why uh, do you think that? Well, and, and, and just by the by, you mentioned about being private parliamentary secretary. I mean, truly, uh, I, I, I was with Michael Patillo for 10 years. And now when you see his career on TV, this wonderful train journey, absolutely fantastic. I've just watched the one he's made on Australia. Marvellous. So many happy times. Well, look, Trudy, uh, the little terrace house where I was born which we still actually have and we're restoring. It's, it's called Beaconsfield Terrace. So how good is, is, is that? Built in 1878. And there's a coal hole with a metal structure over it. So if I was um, coming home from school and I forgot my key, I'd get the coal hole open, <laughs> slide down the coal hole and let myself in. And, you know, the idea that someone, we didn't have a bathroom, we had an outside toilet. Oh, we, we, we were clean, by the way, uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. There was a tin bath hanging on the wall out. I mean, my children now who are comfortable middle class, they get the violin out. But, <laughs> but we didn't have a car. We walked everywhere, two and a half miles to school. We didn't have a telephone. We just threw the window open and shouted loudly at each other. The idea, Jeffrey, that someone like that, who had to go to a speech therapist for two and a half years, because I had a terrible stutter. And it was literally, I had to have a brace on the top of my teeth, bottom of my teeth. And it, it was literally, how now brown cow? They used to apparently call me, not in a nasty way, but double Dutch. The idea that someone from that background, you know, whose mother, became a tea lady. Uh, she became known as Mrs. T in the city of London, most famous tea lady. And my father was an electrician. You know, the idea that I could join the incredibly posh conservative party because where I lived, it, it was always labor. Everything was labor, 100% labor. It's where Keir Hardy, became the first member of parliament. So it, it was jolly, jolly tough, Geoffrey. 
Were your parents no. Labour or Conservative, David? They were apolitical, really. Right. They, were, they weren't into politics, but it was only later in life that I found out, because we did have some posh relatives, I found out, um, that uh, they were Conservative. And we did have a Conservative mayor, because I think in uh, both our family's side, there was a bit of a, um, um, a sort of business uh, attitude in in the more really but but remember Trudy and and Jeffrey because Jeffrey's pointed out that I'm older one year uh, <laughs> but my, 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 my parents were both involved in the second world war you know my mother on the land army my father drew the petrol tanks uh, at, at the front etc but I I think now it is a bit easier. Oh God, this is not going to be liked by my colleagues. It is a bit easier to become an MP. I mean, the stupid and Trudy, I you you weren't chosen from an open. You think Trudy was that? Trudy, you weren't you weren't you weren't chosen from an open primary, were you? Um, I wasn't I was the only person selected and uh, but I think you're right David but I think the difference for me is the internet yeah you know so yeah. much information that I could glean from the web about what an MP does what the allowances are you know what the working arrangements are there were videos from MPs but also I think the difference between 2017 and, and 1983, particularly with the Conservative Party, is the concerted effort to have members of parliament that represent the whole of society. Yes. And, yes. and that, that, that made that a big was, difference. I, that, was, I, that was the I, purpose I, of my question. Yeah. I, you know, I, I do think that everybody now, wherever they come from, can have an aspiration to rise from wherever they come from to wherever their talents and ability is going to take them. And I do think on the whole, education is much better now. And certainly aspiration, what, what, what schools and parents teach people now is aspiration. I had a school motto, which said, I can because I think I can. And aspiration, you know, we were taught that, you know, whatever you want to do, if you're good enough, you can do it. And I think and the youngsters, I don't know whether Trudy would agree with this, the youngsters have much more of that aspiration than perhaps our generation did, David. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's encouraged. Um, certainly it's what I encourage my children. The worst kind of poverty is the poverty of ambition. And we all know that with a positive mindset, you can achieve far more. So I think that kind of um, permission to be who you want to be and to find ways to educate yourself. If you maybe haven't done so well at school, you know, I didn't leave school with any good GCSEs, but at age 35, I was able to go and join a, a part-time degree um, study in sustainable communities. So also the ability to pick up and learn, I think is much more prevalent now. I think it's something actually that the government has really recognised practical skills for as well. And the prime minister will often say that, um, you know, talent is widespread, but opportunity is not. So the changes, particularly in the North, have been very welcome as an MP from the North, but it's that that's really enabled me to be where I am today. And many more people who maybe hadn't had the you know, the Etonian education that in decades gone by was so seemingly prescribed to Conservative MPs. But clearly you broke the mould, David, clearly. What did your parents say when you well, confided look, that you were thinking about this? I'm confessing to the viewers now. First, I've always had grand ideas and been slightly over the top because I think you, you make the most of your God-given talents and there is a talent within everyone and you make your most of your opportunities which is why I'm a conservative through and through and to get back to your point Jeffrey I know why I'm a conservative I didn't wake up one morning and say oh well it seems to be going the conservative way so I'll join the conservatives oh it's going against the conservatives so I'll swap parties no it's because I I believe in things so truly if I tell you the first thing I decided I wanted to be a teacher and I know, I mean, my, my mother dominated my father, but he was happy to be dominated, frankly, but he brought the money home each week to, 
uh, feed us all. Um, my mother thought I was overly ambitious, wanting to be a teacher. Well, I did become a teacher, not particularly a good one, I have to say. But anyway, but a very short while a teacher. When I decided I wanted to become a parliamentarian, they thought this isn't going to happen. Uh, it's just an idea he's got in his head. But the joy was, and I, I, I look, I, I, I'm not sure how people join the party now, but opposite our house was the local treasurer of the ward branch. And he kept putting leaflets through the door. I responded to it. And by the time I'd finished, not only was I ward chairman, association chairman, etc. in a ward committee, we had a committee, which wasn't a talk shot, of 60 active people. So when I fought my first parliamentary election in 1979, I wasn't taking it that this has always been Labour. We, we had like a carnival uh, float. I, I, we, we had a contest for Miss Bluebell. Do you, do you remember, Geoffrey? Trudy's so young, on the buses. Yes. Right. Well, whoever she was, you know, the, 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 um, the, the sort of woman with the glasses who played the downtrodden wife, well, she judged our Miss Bluebell <laughs> competition. <laughs> and of course, all the residents turned round with shock when this cavalcade came down the high street. And I think if you believe in something and are passionate, it's amazing how you can turn things around. And that is why, Trudy, although I know, ladies and gentlemen, within our party, it's a bit controversial at the moment, levelling up, you know, you're levelling up and are the South suffering, but we won't even go there. But I think it's magnificent that we've got all these new colleagues from your neck of the woods. And if I tell my story, you know, that I'm in the gutter, they're way lower than that. There seems to be a race who's had the tougher background. And when I listen to some of their stories and think of the opportunities my own family have, but listen to their stories, you know, broken homes, um, terrible tragedies, and yet through sheer determination, they're representing our party and wow, they've become MPs. So really, Jeffrey. Yeah, going back nearly 40 years, it, it, it was a shock then. One final thing before I go over, over to Trudy's question, and this will make you laugh, uh, because in Trudy's time, we, we, we haven't had anything called pairing. But as you know, we used to pair or try and get a pair with uh, the members of the opposite party so you wouldn't have to vote. So on the first day, this chap came up to me and said, oh, are you, you're, you're, you're a new MP, aren't you? Yes. He said, well, uh, I'd like to pair with you. I don't know what he was talking about. He explained it. I said, um, well, I'm delighted to, but you're conservative and I'm conservative. So, Jeffrey, I had long <laughs> hair. <laughs> and to him, I look like a Labour Member of Parliament. But things have tra changed dramatically. Over to you, Trudy. No, no. Uh, well, I'm I'm still quite keen to understand your journey. Um, but what would you say the funniest moment in the book is um, that you maybe want to give us a sneak peek about? Well, a number of my colleagues would say when we went to meet the Pope. So uh, I was born a Catholic, I'll die Catholic. Until I'm dead, I won't know whether or not it was all a lot of nonsense. So I'm sticking with it, but I don't talk religion. And every year I was the chairman of the all party parliamentary group to the Holy See because it was formed because Blair wanted to shut down our embassy in the Vatican, which he did ridiculous. And, and we managed to get a, a, a very nice residence, but it's just outside the... Vatican. So one year I've taken this group over to see the, well, I'm able to say the retired Pope, the German who's still alive. And he did these audiences in a very different way. I mean, Jeffrey and Trudy, how lucky am I am? The first one was to see John Paul II. And that's why in the book, I think I've got a picture of him cuddling my 36 year old daughter's 
uh, face, ju just like that. Amazing, amazing chap. But the retired Pope was sort of a, a door figure. And um, when it got to being presented with him, I had all these holy relics for him to bless. And he's just coming up to me. And this woman just barged me. I dropped the, I won't swear, but I dropped everything, sort of reached down to pick them up, put them in my hand. And instead of putting the rosary bees in my hand, I put a mint that I have been sucking. And I've got a picture of the Pope blessing the holy mint. And then the, the other thing that happened, I mean, I was so thrilled when I won the seat for the first time because your by-election victory was amazing. And I want you presently to tell the viewers your story in your battle about uh, nuclear power because you can oh. be so proud of yourself there and you've got tremendous expertise but um, every time up to now that I win an election uh, the Saturday after the election we have an open top bus I'm at the front of it with a loud hailer and I go around thanking people for voting for me well the first time in 1983 when I did this, I'm, go I'm going through a tiny bit of the constituency, the rural area called Bowers Gifford. Well, I've never seen so many reverse Churchillian gestures in all my life. <laughs> and I'm thinking to my team who did vote for me. But then we came to this rural bit and there were uh, cows in a field. So messing about, I got on the megaphone and I thanked the cows of Bowers Gifford for voting for me. And just like on that advertisement, all their uh, heads turned round and someone elbowed me and said, David, I looked on the other side of the bus and there were our own supporters, <laughs> a couple of female ladies in hats on their deck chairs who thought I had just referred to them as cows. But I could go on and on with, with uh, funny stories and sad stories. And I would say, Trudy, life is short for every one of us. And you've got to have a sense of humour. Yeah. And I do wish that a minority of our colleagues would develop a sense of humour and lighten up a bit, really. Because you need, you need to keep as happy as you can, frankly, to keep going, or otherwise you, you, you get stressed. And look, the three of us have been blessed or otherwise with children. And my goodness, when someone said to myself and my wife, Julia, when they were tiny, enjoy them mm -hmm. when they're small, we had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> and it's when they grow older that different trials and tribulations happen. But look, life is a challenge for us all. But I think, you know, a smile doesn't cost anything at all, does it? It raises spirits. Absolutely. Although sometimes in this job, I feel that we're not given the permission to be happy and joyful and grateful. And I'm so pleased to hear, David, after all your experience, you still you know, champion those kind of positive feelings, because I think you're absolutely right. It really helps me get through the day when I'm happy and smiling. And yes, there are challenges and we take those seriously. Absolutely. But overwhelmingly, you've got to be positive. Well, particularly when we've just gone through what we have. Yeah. And I, I mean, Jeffrey, you, you haven't seen me when I was very tribal, but in my early years, uh, I, I was sort of like some of our new colleagues keep bash, bash, bash with the opposition. And every time for a while I stood up and I referred to this rotten government. That wasn't our government, but it was the 13 years of the Labour government. Well, since then, uh, there are a number of people on the opposition who I do business with and have sort of become good friends, really. And they've got tremendous sense of humour. Uh, and just as we might smile about some of our colleagues, they smile about their colleagues. And it is a shame. You see, Jeffrey, Trudy mentioned the tea room. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm impressed by that because the tea room, when we worked 
uh, Monday to Friday, but Monday to Thursday until two, three, four o'clock in the morning. The tea room was the engine room of everything and all, all the stories you, you, you would listen to. But because we do shorter hours, I think we've we've sort of lost that really, Jeffrey. And I do think, Trudy, that, um, look, we probably go to Guido now to learn about people's private lives. But I think that is a shame. And I think in the we're supposed to be honourable and right honourable. And I think in the privacy of the tea room, that sometimes when you can take a colleague aside, learn about their trials and tribulations and perhaps encourage them. Because I've seen so many sad cases, Jeffrey, as I know you have over the years, and you just wish you had been there for them to help them and support them. And I, I just feel, Trudy and Jeffrey, that our new colleagues elected on the 12th of December 2019 have had such a rotten introduction, really, because of the coronavirus pandemic. I just hope that there are some people who are helping them and, and, and guiding them. That, that, that's what I really hope. But Trudy, when we get back in the autumn, God willing, we'll, we'll be able to see one another physically again. David, I'm longing to know, in your book, you talk about the slow death of Parliament. What did you actually mean by that? <laughs> well, look, um, and this will upset some colleagues. I want to see the chamber full. When the chamber is full, the government is held to account. And look, I'm a Conservative through and through. I support the government. But we need people to be there to challenge the executive, and then you get better government. But I mean, look, Jeffrey, at the moment, three minute speeches, no one bothers about the opening and closing of things. It's, it's all been dumbed down. And Trudy mentioned the internet. Look, this is good, but there are some bad things about it as well. You know, don't start me on social media and the effect that and Facebook, TikTok has on, on people's, uh, did I say TikTok? It is cool. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. I'm very impressed, actually, David. Well, sure you missed yeah. TikTok, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. But I think that uh, we've lost the power of oratory. Now, I'm not suggesting, Jeffrey, that people sit there for five or six hours listening to it all. And although I was against the call lists, which they've always had in the House of Lords, I'm now warming to the virtues of knowing when you're going to be spoken, when you're going to be speaking. And I don't mind if I am tail end, Charlie. I couldn't, couldn't care less about, the, about that. But I do think when we're in a chamber, a full chamber, it encourages and helps you and you develop an argument. I don't even think we're having much of an argument anymore at the moment. And all governments um, are annoyed by being held to account. That goes with the territory because we're all human uh, beings. But I think over the last 10, 20 years, it's just gone down and down and down, which is why I voted against the televising of parliament. I mean, truly, you don't have to go into the chamber now, do you? You can sit in your room watch it all on there and I'm as guilty as that you know to think that I you know that I actually asked the PM a question from the comfort of my own home well <laughs> PMQs from the comfort of his own home you know these were this, most this definitely unprecedented so events I, I suppose what I'm saying Trudy to Jeffrey is because I've been there a good while and I love the place and I know that it is the mother, although I've been told off for saying it, the mother of all parliaments. And we've got so much, you know, you go around all the, 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 the world and you can see how they've tried to copy our parliament. Our standards were so high, but it isn't like that now. And you see the opposition aren't really holding the government to account as they used to. You know, I was there, as I think you might have been for some of the time, Jeffrey 
when, oh, to come in for the 10 o'clock wind-ups, as it was called, you'd be trembling like that. And you had to think on your feet. And we, we saw the great tussles. I'm not just talking about the famous thing when Jeffrey made his speech to try and bring Margaret down with the broken back going to the crease and all, all, all Jeffrey of that. Howe, not Jeffrey, not me. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff, <laughs> Je Jeffrey Howe. Yeah, yeah. You, you wouldn't do it. Uh, ever, ever, ever do that, Geoffrey. And um, when I think of the clashes between uh, Leon Britton and Michael Heseltine and uh, someone I was PPS to at Wiener Curry, incredible debates. And I was also there, Geoffrey, uh, when uh, Robin Corbyn, uh, who was the Foreign Secretary, made that incredible speech against um, Tony Blair. And uh, me, amazing times. And although I really, really do regret that I believe what Blair was saying about the weapons of mass destruction and then uh, change my, my, my vote. I, I, I do think that when, we, when the chamber was more central than it is now, and Blair hated coming to the chamber. That's why I don't know if you realize, Trudy, that there were nearly 400 Labour MPs we, we only used to have two desks where you would go and register your vote, but it was because the Labour Party, it took so long to get them through the division lobbies. That's why we introduced a third desk there. But I, I, I think the chamber should still be the centre. I know there's an argument about going to the Midlands and North and all that, and we could talk about that another time, ladies and, and gentlemen. But I do think the chamber is all important. Another thing, Jeffrey. Look, you're not wearing a shirt. Uh, well, yes, you are wearing a shirt. You're not wearing a jacket and tie today. And and good on you. But you would never appear in the chamber, would you, without no, a jacket no. and tie? No. And it just dumbs it all down. And uh, we're not even bothering with um, talking about people's constituency. Occasionally, we're just calling one another by a name. So I do think the uh, speaker and, and his deputies are right calling people to account. I mean, I could go on and on about this, but look, it was Norman Sinjin Stevens, Trudy, I, I don't know if you realize, who brought in the select committees. And the select committees in some sense, Jeffrey, they've become as important as what goes on in the chamber whether it's to see Murdoch's ex-wife, you know, slapping that person in the public gallery round the face or whatever she did. But I, I, I want to see the chamber brought back. And I also want Trudy, our colleagues to realize we can't all be ministers. Mm -hmm. Once yeah. you're on that slope, there's only one way you can go and it's down like that. And it is so possible as a backbencher to get legislation yeah. and, and to change things and you can make a real difference. And in a full chamber, when we can get back to making passionate speeches, because look, I, I want a bit of passion. I want a round an argument. I want to get back the atmosphere that we used to have. But anyway, was, and Jeffrey, I am dead against us leaving the building for 10 years. If we left for 10 years, we would never return. Yet we, we, we've got to restore the place, but no leaving for 10 years. If anyone leaves, leaves let it be the House of uh, Lords. So I absolutely agree with you there, David, yeah. actually. As you know, I've got Sellafield in my constituency, one of the most hazardous industrial sites in the world that we are taking down piece by piece decommissioning whilst it remains a fully functional workplace and I encourage Parliament to understand how you can do this safely um, by zoning and you know taking uh, the measures needed but being able to operate safely and for me it's the lack of maintenance in Parliament that's caused this and a, and a schedule of maintenance would have prevented some of the challenges that we've got today, but I think with that kind of approach, we could remain there, absolutely. Trudy, so, I wanted Geoffrey in a minute to say something about fire safety, but will you just tell our viewers about um, your expertise in, in nuclear energy? Because of course, my great friends were Anne Widdicombe, 
uh, uh, Olga Maitland, and I'm trying to remember who the third one was. Do you, do you, do you, do you remember all the demonstrations, uh, Green and Common and all of that, and, and, and Joan Ruddick? So will you tell our viewers how important your area is in terms of nuclear energy and the wonderful, successful campaign you personally have fought. Well, you're very kind, but as with all these things that we achieve, it's a huge team effort. And I am blessed to live in the center of nuclear excellence. But I do remember being born in 1976, in 1986 after Chernobyl, and then the fear that rippled through the whole world um, that was you know, disproportionate actually, but that fear really had a, a negative impact on nuclear energy, which is the only always on proven power generation at large scale that um, I would certainly advocate that net zero needs, you know, net zero needs nuclear. But my concern at the moment is that we're going to be losing about six and a half gigawatts of power from the advanced gas cooled reactors around the country as we're also trying to decarbonize. So, um, you know, we haven't got time to discuss it now, but I founded the Nuclear Delivery Group, which has brought together academia, industry, um, and in particular lobbying bays to recognize that we're going to need a huge, huge investment of buildings and the kind of co-generation capacity as, you know, power stations also can generate hydrogen for big heavy freight and vehicles that require that kind of propulsion that you're never going to get from an electric vehicle. So I was delighted when the Prime Minister committed to point three on the 10 point plan, that commitment to advanced modular reactors, small modular reactors and gigawatt plus. And like I am a nuclear nuisance or an atomic kitten. You are the voice of South End becoming a city. <laughs> and I think it's actually really important that us parliamentarians are known for something, really get behind something. And I know that, you know, you're a, a keen fundraiser for um, endometriosis. And I just wondered where that particular um, concern for the condition and interest in raising money came from. Bless you for saying all, all of that, Trudy. Well, there was a constituent called Carla Cressy who um, came to see him at my surgery. She looked lovely, but beneath her appearance, she was really suffering because she had this uh, illness called endometriosis, which, yes, Trudy, I'm going to admit, I'd never heard of. Mm -hmm. Here's me with a wife and four daughters, but I do understand a lot about it now. And um, a million and a half women are affected by this issue. And I'm delighted to say that through the all party parliamentary group, we've got the government's health department now to have a whole strategy to deal with issues that affect ladies with endometriosis. And we've got a wonderful all party parliamentary group. I mean, viewers might think it's strange to have a chap as chairman, but that's how they wanted it because they felt that we chaps didn't understand enough about what you ladies suffer. So yes, part of the sale of the book is, 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 is going to that. And, and, and Jeffrey, before you ask me about a charity, would you just say something to the viewers about fire safety? Yes, um, fire safety is incredibly important, and, and I congratulate you wholeheartedly for your chairmanship of the All Party um, uh, Fire Safety Group. I, I think I think that's what it's called. And of course, I am fortunate enough to have the National Fire College in my constituency, which actually is sort of branched out a bit. Not only is it the um, prime centre for learning about all matters to do with fire. It's now branched out into more of a emergency resilience college to try and bring all the blue light uh, activities together, uh, how to deal with a real sense of emergency. And it's even branched out further now. It now does um, sort of exercises with the army and the SAS. But I am delighted that your fire safety group is coming to visit the college oh. fairly shortly. Yeah. And, 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 and with all the Grenfell Tower stuff and everything else, I mean, you are the right man at the right time. Tell us all about it. Well, um, as far as the all party parliamentary fire safety group is concerned, ladies and gentlemen, this is something that I've been involved with 
uh, for a long time. And unfortunately, we made recommendations which weren't listened to. And this is governments of all political persuasions in terms of <clears throat> what the cladding on buildings consists of and on fire safety generally. But look, we, we're drawing a line underneath it all. We're totally involved in what is happening now. Uh, it, it's a very well attended all party parliamentary group and we're making uh, a number of proposals to the government and the government through Robert Jemrick and others are really listening and acting to them. But it's a terribly difficult issue, as you know, in terms of responsibility for leaseholders, Geoffrey. But the charity, you, you know, that as chaps, we, we're not so health conscious, perhaps, as ladies. So Prostate, um, the charity that some of the um, royalties go to, was again inspired by a local resident um, who was suffering from prostate cancer and through gene therapy uh, has now recovered. And we, we had a launch at Parliament, the Speaker, uh, very kindly came and um, started the uh, launch off. And yes, some of the royalties are going to that. Now, Trudy and Jeffrey, the three of us have got a number of constituents with learning difficulties. Had either of you heard of the Music Man project? No. No. Okay. Well, uh, again, a wonderful constituent called David Stanley, who I'm delighted to say has just been appointed as special advisor uh, to the government on people with learning difficulties. Uh, he was a fabulous deputy head teacher at one of our schools together with his wife. And they both felt very strongly that through the power of music, you could transform people's lives with learning difficulties. Because Jeffrey and Trudy, when I first became an MP, I was taken to a mental health centre and saw people with learning difficulties in straitjackets. Now, I thought that was the norm. And, and not a lot was done with these people. Now, it's just amazing what can be done through the power of music with these people with learning difficulties. So we put on a fabulous show at the London Palladium. I did my Bruce Forsyth act a wonderful show at the Royal Albert Hall. And if it hadn't been for the coronavirus pandemic, we'd have been going across a big pond and putting on a show on Broadway, but that is going to happen. So that is what uh, the royalties for this book is going to go to. So ladies and gentlemen, as we come to the end of this video, without embarrassing my two colleagues, I think, Trudy, you are incredible. Oh my goodness, uh, don't! Really, really <laughs> incredible. And what a role model you are to others, frankly. A busy mum coming from a humble background and yet there you are sitting in parliament. You could be so proud of yourself and I bet your family are proud of yourself and you've really put Copeland on the map. And tell our viewers, Trudy, unlike me, how big your constituency is. Gosh, you put me on the spot there. I actually don't know the specific answer in terms of hectares, acres or square miles. I didn't know, used to know the answer to this. But I can certainly tell you it takes me about an hour and 45 minutes to get from one village to the other on the other side. But, um, you know, when you live in the place that you represent, it really isn't a chore. And I this morning had the pleasure of introducing Farming Minister Victoria Prentice into Wasdale. It didn't feel like work, if I'm honest. It's an absolute privilege to serve Copeland in all its glory. And I wouldn't want to serve any other place. I love it. It's home. It's where I hope my children find successful careers. And um, I'm just so, so lucky. Well, Victoria is a fabulous minister. And it's ironic, Geoffrey. We've got two ministers called Victoria. And I both sat in Parliament with both of their fathers. <laughs> anyway, I, I just so want to... 
Yes, yeah. and I had I had uh, Victoria to my constituency yesterday, so <laughs> she's obviously working very hard on the on the circuit. Uh, like Trudy, mine is a huge constituency. It's six hundred square miles. It takes me an hour and a half from one end to the other, but it's so big that it's being divided in two by the Boundary Commission. So I will become a different member of Parliament, hopefully in the next uh, Parliament. But it's been David a great pleasure to support you over this book. I hope it makes huge amounts of money for three very 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 well uh, deserved charities. Um, uh, congratulations to you for doing that. It's, it's amazing. And I will now uh, definitely get hold of the book and read it all rather than just the <laughs> synopsis. So yeah. there we are, ladies and gentlemen. And just as Copeland has got a wonderful MP, the Cotswolds has as well. There we are, the book, Eyes and Ears, A Survivor's Guide to Westminster. Do please buy it because all the money goes to charity. And thanks again to both my colleagues for interviewing me. Bye, everyone. Thanks, David. Well done. Bye. Bye. Well Bye. done, David. Bye, Trudy. Bye. 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 This is my journey so far. Where I was born. Where I became a councillor. When I was first elected to Parliament and where I am now the Member of Parliament for. Enjoy my journey.
I hope you enjoy reading my book, Eyes and Ears, A Survivor's Guide to Westminster. <laughs>